Thank you. That's going to be a hard act to follow, especially since I'm going to jump into math, which is generally not everybody's favorite topic. Um, I want to start by saying that this work that I'm presenting was done by Dr. Chung Hui Huang, who is right here up in the front. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher in my lab, and she is fabulous. My job is basically finding good people and pointing them at problems, getting out of their way. Um, so this, this work that she was doing, I, any other parents in the room can remember back in March 2020 when the school shut down. That was hard. And one of the big debates that we've had throughout this pandemic has been, do kids spread COVID at schools? And if they do, how do we stop it? And there's been a lot of debate. There's been people looking at different ways of studying the issue. We went back to first principles and said, can we build a model that recreates what is happening in the schools and using the Shield Illinois data, which is some of the best data in the world as far as school transmission, can we understand where is COVID being transmitted among these kids and employees at schools? So the background that we have, uh, our elementary and middle schools reopened to in-person instruction in 2021. Uh, various times, they, they could start opening in fall 2021. By fall 2022, they were all open. And we had a mask mandate in place. This was great. Uh, we recommended weekly testing. All of the schools had the option for weekly testing. And uh, starting in spring 2021, of course, vaccination was available for adults, but it took a lot longer, especially for younger kids to come along so vaccination wasn't really available for a lot of these kids while they were in school. Uh, so the school districts that we looked at, this is looking only at the K through eight schools. Chung Hui has done a great job looking at all of the different school types, but we're just gonna present on the K through eight schools. So these are school districts that have kindergarten through middle school. And it's about half elementary school kids, about a third middle school kids, and the remainder is the employees. Um, population of these schools ranged from 200 to 6,500, so that it's a real range of school sizes, and you can see the dots of where they are in the state. They're all over the state, mostly in the Chicago area, that's where the population is, but we've got some as far down as the bottom of southern Illinois. So we needed to recreate the school environment in our model. And we were using a lot of data from a lot of different sources. So we have school demographics from the Department of Ed. We have population in the county from the census. Uh, we have from the CDC, we have vaccination rates and vaccine and mask effectiveness, but we also have the county level uh, incidents. And then Shield Illinois gave us the testing data aggregated at the school level. So, so we had the testing data at the school level we knew employees and students, but we didn't know anything else about them. And then we had some data on mask adherence, but this is from the COVID-19 Trends and Impacts Survey, which is done in partnership with Facebook. It gets about a third of US adults. It does not have the kid data. So we know about how well adults at the county level are wearing their masks over time. And so we re recreated the school population. We have this little bubble with the uh, dashed line that is the school. And within the school, we have three different separate populations. You've got the elementary kids, the middle school kids, and the employees. Now our data didn't separate out the elementary and middle school employees, so we just had employees as one group. And we can assume that the employees are interacting with both the student groups but that the elementary and middle school kids aren't really interacting with each other that much. If you know these kids, they're probably not interacting with each other at school. That would not be cool for the middle schoolers. So, so we're assuming that the, the students aren't interacting among their groups, they're just within their own group, but the employees can contact either group. But they also live in community. So these students are out there interacting in the community when they're outside of school, so there can be transmission outside of school. And so we end up with this contact matrix for anybody who likes the math. This is what our Wayview matrix looks like, that there's no transmission 
between the two ages of students, but everything else, there is some sort of transmission rate. We just don't know what that is. So we built this compartment model to, and um, for those who aren't familiar with compartment models, it's basically we divide the compartment or the population into different compartments that are homogenous, meaning the only difference between individuals in these compartments is what their disease status is. Uh, the, uh, except for the quarantine department compartment, everybody can interact with everybody else. So what we have is we have unvaccinated susceptible individuals. And they could get vaccinated and they become vaccinated susceptible individuals. Either of those groups could be infected and then they become infected either unvaccinated or vaccinated through within school transmission or through community exposure. Once they become infected, they could be caught through testing and quarantined, but whether or not they are, they will eventually recover. And we made the assumption that once you recover, you move into what we call the vaccinated susceptible population because you do get some level of immunity from being infected. I do not recommend getting infected for immunity. Vaccination is much safer, but the, you do get some level of immunity. So it's more like you're vaccinated than you, like you're fully susceptible. So this is the format of our model. This is the assumption of how these transmissions work. And if you really like the math, this is what it looks like mathematically. We just put that in there so you can see there is math there. But, um, and the only thing I'm gonna add from this slide is that we did have something in place for understanding that there were different waves of variants and they have slightly different infectiousness. So we took the data starting from spring 2021 all the way through March 2022 and you'll see the, the black dots are the overall incidence among the student groups at the left and the employee groups at, on the right. Um, this is overall, but we actually fitted by individual schools, not for the overall. And then that red line is what our model predicted after using what we call approximate Bayesian computation to fit the model to the data. And that, that shaded area is the uncertainty around our prediction. So you can see that we actually managed to fit to the data pretty well that our model can actually recreate what happened as far as incidents at the total level. And if you break it down school by school, you see about the same thing. But, well, sure we can recreate what we fit to, but can we actually do something more with it? So from March, 2022 to the end of the semester, we kept that data out and didn't use it in our fitting. And then we saw if our model would continue to predict and you can see there, that's the blue dots. And after that blue line, we still managed to fit pretty well. So we're pretty happy with our model fitting that our model can actually recreate what was happening in the Shield Illinois schools. So now we have a mathematical representation of what was going on in the schools. So the question becomes, what do we do with that? And the question really is, well, where were these transmissions happening? We're clearly recreating the transmissions, but where were they coming from? So we look at the fitted values for the different transmission rates. And these are the, uh, the range of fitted values for each of the types of transmissions. So there on the left, you see the, the five different types of within school transmission. And on the right, you can see those external transmission rates. And you're gonna see right away external transmission rates were a heck of a lot higher in these schools than internal transmission rates, except the uh, employees. The employee to employee transmission seemed to be a lot higher, but in these Shield Illinois schools with the mask mandates, with the weekly testing, it looks like most of the transmission that we were catching was happening in the community, not inside the schools. So that's from our fitting procedure, but we can say, okay, we have this theoretical model, it's fitted. What if we change things? How much of an effect does it have on this incidence? And so we do what we, is called a global sensitivity analysis. I'm gonna orient you to this because I know it's uh, unusual for, for most people. So there on the x-axis is what we call a correlation coefficient. If you are far to the right off that zero line, that means that increasing that parameter will increase the incidence. 
If you're far to the left, then increasing that parameter will decrease the incidence. And this is looking at only one size of schools, and you can see we have unvaccinated and vaccinated students on the left and unvaccinated and vaccinated employees on the right. And looking at the different parameters, I know you don't want to read all of the Greek, so Cheng Wei's highlighted some of those. The testing proportion, what proportion of students are testing, mattered most for the unvaccinated students in this particular group. Doesn't really matter for the unvaccinated employees or the vaccinated employees, and didn't matter that much for the vaccinated students. So it's the unvaccinated students who are most protected by increasing the number of testing. And what was really driving it was the external transmission rates, that whole transmission in the community. If we see more transmission in the community, we will see more at the schools. Now, the within school transmission rates were important in different school types. So this is looking at different school sizes. So there at the top left is the smallest schools and at the bottom right is the largest schools. And you can see as the school size increased, that within school transmission importance also increased. But so did the importance of having a higher proportion of students testing. So as school size increases, it's harder to keep down the within school transmission, but if you increase testing, you can kind of counteract that. And if we break it down as all the school sizes and all the population groups, there's a lot of information there. But basically, as population increases, the importance of within school transmission increases, but also does the importance of within school testing. So we can say smaller schools with a mask mandate and a little bit of testing can do just fine. Larger schools, you need more testing. And we asked, well, what if we increased frequency of testing? And weekly testing was about what the schools could handle, but just out of curiosity, if we increase the frequency of testing, yes, transmission would go down. Not actually practical, but just of interest to us as academics. Sometimes these academic uh, public health partnerships, we're going to do stuff just for our own sake. Um, so our, our biggest conclusions are that external transmission rates were much greater than within school transmission rates with the caveat this was under mask mandates so universal mask mandates for school and these were all shield illinois schools so they were all providing weekly testing so don't go out and say well school transmission didn't matter because school transmission didn't matter under certain circumstances and that included the mask mandate and the testing being available uh, within school transmission rates are more important in those larger schools. So if we're going to target which schools get testing, if we only have a limited amount of testing, those larger schools are going to be more important. And weekly testing proportion, so how many of the students within the school are testing each week, can actually mitigate some of the impact of that larger school size. So. Um, as an epidemiologist, I have to say it depends, and there are potential biases in our approach. Um, these schools had different amounts of time that they were participating, so I only showed the overall timeline, but each school signed on at a different time and stopped at a different time, so we have different lengths of time by schools. And remember that weekly testing in schools was optional and voluntary, and you'll hear, I think, later in the symposium on how the, the optional option was made possible. Um, there were different guidelines and different testing groups by schools. So these schools were not identical as far as their testing programs, but we didn't have that data when we built the model. That would be something for the future to build that into our models. Also, our mask adherence data, this was only representing a third of adults in the US, which is not, <laughs> a great sample size. I mean, it's better than a lot of what we have, but it's also only adults. So we don't know if kids were wearing masks outside of school. We know they were supposed to be wearing masks in school. We also don't have data on how well mask adherence was uh, policed within the schools. There are definitely school districts that were less likely to enforce mask wearing within schools. So our big take home message is that testing does decrease within school transmission of COVID-19. So if the question is, 
Do kids transmit COVID at school? Yes. Can we stop it? Mostly, yes. So I uh, have to really thank our entire group. Chung Hui did an amazing job putting it all together. And the Shield Illinois and Shield T3 teams who uh, really supported us getting that data together and giving us the interesting questions. And then our funding came from RADx and also from Shield T3. So thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and open this for questions, if anyone has questions for Becky. And I might throw them to Chung Hui, who has agreed to answer some questions. Hi. Uh, did you notice any differences in the different types of vaccines that they were given, like uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson, or you didn't care about that? We didn't have that data. We just had overall vaccination rates. So we didn't actually have data on who was vaccinated in schools. We just knew what the proportion of people within the county in the different age groups were vaccinated. Becky, I'm Pedro uh, from the UFI. So my question is about the exercise you presented, increasing fr uh, testing frequency. I understand it's an exercise, but my doubt is, is that based on the recommendation of a test per week, or is it based on the actual proportion of people doing one, step, one test per week? Because of the way that the model is structured, it's actually going to be increasing the proportion of testing because again, we didn't know who was testing, we only knew what proportion was testing. So if you increase from weekly to daily, and you're randomly selecting people from the infected category to get tested, you're more likely to get more of them. That was one of our um, potential downsides is that we didn't know who was testing, we had only the aggregate data, how many tested and how many were positive. So we couldn't do what's called an agent-based model where we know which students are testing and which are not. All we had was, okay, we have a selection of the school testing. We didn't even know if it was the same students week to week. For your sensitivity analyses, the PRCCs, did you do this by wave also, or are these just average? I just wonder if maybe more frequent testing is more important when you have a more transmissible strain. So I was just curious. Yeah, so, so we did it by semester, actually. So, so we have, the, the, if you saw, there were three bars for every parameter, and it was the three different semesters, which fairly align with the waves. So, so yeah. It, there wasn't a huge amount of difference among the semesters as far as the effect, although some things did come up in spring 2022 when we're getting into the, uh, that was Omicron, right? Yeah, that, that, was, that was, some things were becoming more important than when we're highly transmissible. Hi, my name is Harsh Tanija from the University of Illinois. So, my question is that I just can't help think that, you know, these schools are in very different counties and even very different neighborhoods within each county. So, I mean, is there a way to think about how the general attitudes of populations that go to each of those schools or each of those school districts towards COVID, how do they factor into explaining some of this, you know? Yeah, that, that is a really good question. That's kind of what we were trying to get at with the mask adherence data because that was at the county level and mask adherence at the county level self-reported in adults might correlate with the amount of concern. But again, we didn't have data on how well, say, the schools were enforcing mask mandates within schools or what activities were still open. Some of that is out there, it's just we didn't have it within the scope of this project and it's worth looking at. So, so the question is, do, did we account for siblings or for parents? No, because all we had was how many tested and how many tested positive. We didn't know anything about household transmission, so we just had within school transmission and external transmission, we, 
we didn't really have any of that information built in. Uh, with modeling, you have to kind of make assumptions, and so that's where we were going based on what data we had. We would have loved to have built more, more complex models, but at some point the complexity gets so high that what can we even say about what we're learning? So, but yeah, it w would have been great to have an, an, an individual level. It would be wonderful to build all of that. That just gets into a little bit of privacy concerns about the data. Uh, Jared Shooter from Battelle. Uh, also about the sensitivity analysis, I guess. Um, you would expect that what happens at a larger school would would have a larger impact on like incidence rates just because more students are there. Um, it, is like the size of the school accounted for in that analysis so that like when you see less of an impact at smaller schools than larger schools, is it really due to the school size uh, because the interactions between students are fundamentally different, or is it just because there are fewer students there? So, uh, that is a good question. I think if I'm going to go with, based on my understanding of modeling theory, it's going to be uh, a lot to do with the number of students just present, and especially because if you have more introduction from the community, if you have a higher number of students getting infected and bringing it to school, there's going to be more transmission within the school. Whereas in a smaller community, you might have one kid per week bringing it from the outside and you're less likely to get the transmission within the school. So it's kind of just a numbers game as far as school size. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Rebecca, for your talk. Enrique Valera from UIUC. Um, so I was wondering if you're still collecting data now that the the mandate of wearing the mask is not on anymore. So I, I would assume that Shield Illinois still has all of that data and you'll hear more later about the data that they have available. We, we have stopped the modeling with the end of that school year, but it would be great to revisit that data later mm -hmm. and look at without the mask mandates. Um, a lot of other things also changed. Right. So it, it might be interesting to try to look at it, but we can't just isolate just the dropping of the mask mandate in school. Um, it, it, there's going to be a lot of other stuff going on right, that, that will have to play into it. With, with the current data that you have and the current version of your model, the model can predict the impact of wearing the mask in the transmission? The, the impact of wearing the mask? Yes. Uh, so, so we looked at mask wearing in the community as an impact on community transmission. Um, we just assumed within school everybody was wearing a mask because it was under the mask mandate and we didn't have any data to say otherwise. Thank you. For the larger schools, are you just increasing the number of people in your model or are you changing anything about the interactions? I just wonder if the results are driven by larger class sizes, so people interacting more in their classes or just kind of sheer numbers. I just was curious if you looked at that. Yeah, so, so we didn't have any information on any of that, but what we did was we fit the transmission rates at a school level. So the transmission fitting was at the school level. It was somewhat overall transmission fitting, but each, each individual school had their own transmission rates. Okay, so it's just kind of captured by the average transmission rate, yeah. and those tended to be higher in the bigger schools, which may be because of bigger class sizes or not. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Becky. <laughs>